I teach in the Faculty of Economics, but our teaching is quite diverse. We have a great variance. So in particular, during the last nine years, I've been teaching also in political science, which is quite different in comparison of undergrad students in economics or business administration. So I have several challenges, in particular that most of my students hate numbers and they only like political theories. I'm re referring to political science, but my subject is an introduction to economics that combines a part of microeconomics and another part of macroeconomics. So I have one of my, um, my objectives is that they interpret figures and they lose the fear because they are completely frightened when they, they, one of the drawbacks of the Spanish educational system is that they can choose subjects since they are very young. So perhaps since 12 or 13 years old, they have chosen another subject different from mathematics. So when they reach to university, the first year, they find my subject and I start talking about supply and demand and price and quantity and afterwards the GDP, inflation rate, these things, and they are like crazy. So uh, with calm and a lot of patience, I have decided uh, different activities to introduce economic analysis, reflection, but also a bit of, of mathematics and numbers because they are they are a part of economic science. So I'm going to share with you the presentation, but I also introduced what was the the main objective. So as I said before, I wanted to explain microeconomic concepts to use an example with real data. And also given last, last year, it was very, very complicated because from Friday to Monday, we have to change everything from face-to-face -to, -face to online education. And this year, again, we have combined face-to-face -face and online one day each type of education. And um, I decided to use real data about COVID in this activity. So first of all, um, overview of the pharmaceutical industry. The revenues in 2019 amounted to 1.25 trillion. Regarding non-prescription drugs, around 9% of total revenues and generics around 6.32% of total revenues. R&D investment, which is very important to develop new drugs and vaccines, amounted to $186 billion, and the revenue at risk from patent expiration worldwide in this year amounts to $22 billion. The duration of a pharmaceutical patent is 20 years. In the five years between 2015-2019, 120 drugs have been discovered and patented in the US, 58 in Europe, 36 in Japan. Regarding the latest COVID data, there are 162 million confirmed cases and 3.3 unfortunately deceased. So we are every day talking about vaccines, at least in the Spanish news, but there are other alternatives and we are going to focus on these alternatives. Clinical trials are a way to reuse drugs normally indicated for other pathologies. So the shorter development time and the reduced cost make an attractive alternative compared to the development from the start of a new drug in a pandemic situation in which time is a vital question. So I'm going to focus in Remdesivir, Fapiravir, Lopinavir, Hydroxychloroquina, Chloroquina, Acitromicina, Sofosbuvir, Pirfinidone, and Tocilimubab. These drugs have already been tested and used for Ebola, influenza, AIDS, malaria, antiviral processes, and improved lung function. 
So the starting points is that I have used this innovation approach for students in political science and one of my colleagues also in sociology, and I also tested it in economics. The objective is to deepen the knowledge of the pharmaceutical market to demonstrate in a tangible way the differences between production cost and final prices, because in their language, they use cost and price like synonyms, and they are not. To perceive the difficulty of access to certain treatments depending on the country, this is a point of reflection and critical analysis, and reflect on what initiatives should be implemented in a context of international emergency, such as the one we are experiencing. So I have mm, introduced this practice in a small groups. I supervise each small groups. I have an average of 90 students in the classroom. So I divided them voluntarily. They make the groups four or five students, and they made the activities that I'm going to show you uh, by themselves, but also with some supervision. And by the end, they change the, uh, we made a forum and PowerPoint presentations when they offered the results. And also we have a, a light debate to, to exchange the reflections. So the different phases of these activities are the following ones. The estimation of the cost of the pharmaceutical products. I will offer them this basic data because to some extent it's difficult to obtain it. The search for information of the retail price of pharmaceutical products, we will uh, collect this information by ourselves. An activity of reading and reflection on the pharmaceutical market and its specificities, carrying out a series of mathematical exercises and analysis of the analysis of the results and development of proposals to improve access to medicines. So in the first stage, we have data for these different drugs, but in this case, when they have been applied to a standard treatment against COVID-19. So for example, in the case of Remdesivir, the average treatment length was 10 days, the first day two doses, and the other days only one dose. So the total treatment cost was $9, and the cost per day 0 0.9. So in this case, this information was a bit uh, complicated to obtain because you have to enter in the Panjiva Global Trade Insights, which is a database that includes the cost of aptic pharmaceutical ingredients, the excipients formulation and packaging. But once you have all this information, you have the cost of the average treatment. And we can observe that the cost for most drugs is quite accessible, $9, $20, $31, with the exception of tocilimubab, where the cost rises to $177. The second step was to obtain the price of these drugs in a sample of countries. So I'm going to show a subsample of the countries that we analyze in class. So we combine developing countries and um, high-income countries, Bangladesh, Brazil, China, Egypt, USA, France, India, Malaysia, Pakistan, United Kingdom, South Africa, Sweden, and Turkey. In the last column, you have the number of drugs that are commercialized in each country. So in Bangladesh, you can find seven of the previous drugs. I will show you them later. But for example, in Egypt, you can only find two. So students should access to these uh, platforms. So it's like um, an official database where you introduce the active principle and you can observe if it is commercialized or not and in the affirmative case, the price. In case that the active principle is commercialized under different brands, they were uh, told to choose the cheapest one. So finally, they 
obtain this table. In, in fact, they were assigned uh, two or three countries because I recognize that it is, it is a hard work. And afterwards, they exchanged this information so that everybody could have the complete table with all drugs and all countries. So this is the information of prices. So by themselves, they can compare what is cost and what is price. And in this case, we appreciate that in the red rectangle, we have the cheapest drugs, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, acetromycina. In the yellow rectangle, we have the most expensive drugs, Rendesivir, Sofosbuvir, and Perfinedone. So this was the first approach. Afterwards, we started with some reading, where another drawback of the Spanish educational system is that it's quite difficult to achieve a rather acceptable level of English language. So at university, we don't have um, university, we don't have English subjects by themselves, but we are recommended to introduce like exercises or articles in English to incentivize that they have to, to acquire certain vocabulary. So in this case, I recommended two articles, one in Spanish and one in English, just to understand certain particularities of the pharmaceutical market. So previously, one of the introductory terms in the, in the curriculum content is that they have to distinguish between what is perfect competence, monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistic competition. So this was as this was the idea's occasion to interpret that the pharmaceutical market is special because when one laboratory discovers a new drug the laboratory can patent it, and in this case, this constitutes a new monopoly. On one hand, they are incentivizing research and development and the discoveries of new drugs and treatment for pathologies, but on the other hand, you have to pay perhaps a higher price to purchase this drug until the patent has expired. So the question is, do you consider that the knowledge on which new pharmaceutical products are based should be a public good? Never, always, just in certain circumstances. So also in many markets, we observe that as the supply increases or there is an innovation, for example, in the case of computers, prices decrease. At first, the new mobile, the new computer is very expensive, but as time passes by, you can now buy a new television, which is better than the one you purchased 10 years before, and the price is even lower. However, when we apply this reasoning to the pharmaceutical market, we find different things. One of the most important and shocking, shocking things is that in the price of the successful drugs, laboratories are only including the cost of the wasted drugs. So they want to recover the investment, and that's why prices do not evolve in the same way in the pharmaceutical market as in other markets. So they have to acquire a little knowledge about the details, and afterwards, with an Excel sheet, they start doing these exercises. So I'm copying the results they obtained and their comments. First of all, what is the mean average price of each drug taking into account all countries and also the standard deviation? So as we said before, they confirmed that hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, and acetromycina were the cheapest drugs and sofosbuvir, perfinedone, and rendesivir, the most expensive ones. But also, the red underlined figures indicate that sofosbuvir and perfinedone experience the highest standard deviation. So for the same drug, there is a high dispersion between some countries and others. There is, not, there is a high inequality. 
Also, pharmaceutical laboratories are very interested in their makeup ratio. What is the makeup ratio? It's the price minus the marginal cost divided by the marginal cost. So it is the profit that they are obtaining per each treatment. Which is the profit? Well, whether acceptable for Fabiravir, $7, hydroxychloroquine, $6, acetromycina, $14, or tocilimubab, $2.15. For, for suposbuvir, the average profit per treatment is $1,000, which is a lot. It means that it is 160 times, 68 times higher as compared to hydroxychloroquine. And also we observe the highest standard deviation for soposbuvir. There is a highest disparity because, for example, for United States, the profit ratio is $3,721, but the profit ratio for Bangladesh and the same drug is only $32. Why these disparities? We are going to take into account the degree of development of each country. So, the students had to look for the GDP per capita in dollars. They went to the web of the World Bank and they obtained the data that I saw in the first column. And afterwards, they obtained the ratio between the price of the treatment and the GDP per capita. And in this case, we say, wow, the price of the treatment with respect to GDP is nearly 50% in Brazil, or it is 32% for the case of Rendezivir in Bangladesh, or 46% in Pakistan. So it is a lot and compared, as compared to the average economic well-being situation of these countries. Are these going to be able to provide the necessary healthcare to their populations? We may have several concerns about this. So also we say, well, you know that the GDP has many drawbacks. It is very useful in many cases, but there are other indicators. So you are going to look for the amount of public healthcare expenditure per capita, which is in per capita terms, the expenditure of the public health system. So they obtained this column. We appreciate that there are huge difference, $5,355 in the United States as compared to only $7.12 in Bangladesh. So now when we compare the price of the average treatment with respect to the average public healthcare expenditure per capita, we obtain extraordinary figures. In this case, we say, wow, it's in the case of Rendezivir and Bangladesh, it is 8,000 times higher or 2,000 times higher for Sofosbuvir or 9,000 higher for Tocilimubab. So there are many treatments that are totally unaffordable when we look at the real healthcare situations in these countries. In other cases, no. In the United States, you say, well, some treatments are expensive, so for Zubir and Pirfinedone, but others are really acceptable. The cost of hydroxychloroquine is 0.34% with respect to the average healthcare expenditure per capita. Or even in Turkey, 0 0.99% or in United Kingdom, also hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine. So we have many questions um, in our head. So it's true that from the point of view of the production, COVID or drugs to fight against COVID can be obtained at very low prices, $9, $10, $20, $30. So we could take advantage of this situation and apply another economic concept with this economy of scale. 
if you increase the amount of production, it's possible that you are going to reduce the average cost per unit. And also this could be applied not only to production, but also to distribution, because there are distribution lines that are offered for other types of drugs to fight against AIDS, malaria, or tuberculosis. So you could use these channels of distributions to offer the treatment against COVID. And also my students were very worried about the questions of the technology transfer. And they said that we need open technology transfer as there are open systems against the monopoly of Windows. You have open access so that uh, methods used to manufacture key medicines can be shared with any country that chooses to produce land locally. So in emergency situations, there, not be, there should not be intellectual property barriers. So students have valued very positively the relevance of this project. It has helped them to use international statistical portals, which are also in English. It has helped them to reflect the difference between prices and cost. They have carried out in-depth reflection of the existing disparities in access to medicines. And it is essential that generic medicines are accessible to all people, because finally, this is also an economic concept, the concept of positive externality. If you are healthy, it's more probable that people around you are also going to be healthy. So health of some is good for health of all. So thanks for your attention. That was my experience. Um, that's all. Thank you.